seven. So we lost three soldiers in this uh, hard battle. <laughs> Good. Now the title of the second lecture is Manifolds of Very Small Co-Dimension. So let me recall you that we are talking about this context, smooth, irreducible, non-degenerate, and n for the dimension, and c for the codimension. So, um, now, Yesterday we saw something about small codimension. Now we are speaking about very small codimension. What this definition? We say that we have very small codimension if n is at least two times c plus one. Small was bigger equal c. Very small is bigger equal double times double time c plus one. And uh, this uh, well, the terminology is uh, maybe uh, original, but that's not important. This is related to some famous thing. So some famous have some conjecture. which will be abbreviated like this from now on. Let me tell the young people that it's uh, the same Hartson that is torturing you with the book. Uh, <laughs> say, them guy. OK. Telling that if this happens, then x is a complete intersection. So let me remind you that uh, this means that the uh, homogeneous ideal of x Pn, is generated by the minimal possible number of homogeneous elements, namely C. Okay. Or otherwise, also, X is the transverse intersection of C hypersurfaces. This is the same. Transverse means that in each point of X, the intersection of the tangent spaces to the hypersurface, hypersurfaces is a tangent space of X at that point. So this is kind of an ideal situation, right? When uh, this should be considered as the simplest uh, algebraic varieties embedded, algebraic varieties. And Somehow, this is one of the most important problems in algebraic geometry because uh, at least projective algebraic geometry can be defined also as an attempt to understand all manifolds which are not complete intersections. These are considered as trivial. These are the first examples, right? How do you construct? You take uh, C polynomials, uh, let's say, generically. So the intersection is transverse. At each step, the uh, dimension reduces by one, and you get something, something very, very nice, very well behaved. Moreover, the properties of complete intersections are very good. You know the cohomology. You know, practically, you know the canonical class. 
you know everything about them, right? So these being the simplest, what else? Well, this is a difficult problem, of course, but Master Hutchon says that at least if the codimension will be sufficiently small, we have only this. Okay? There are people considering such problem as uh, one uh, maybe the most interesting and uh, puzzling problem in projective geometry. <coughs> oh, so far, good news. Now, some bad news. This conjecture was formulated by Hudson in 74. And uh, we haven't seen any progress. <laughs> on it since. <laughs> so uh, let me say that many mathematicians uh, who thought about this extremely difficult problem uh, believe that uh, maybe it is not true. But uh, the point is that Hartzog was a bit cheating namely that he formulated this bound on the basis of some examples on the boundary. So he knew about some special, very special examples. Some of them will be mentioned in uh, the near future. And he said, well, OK, because of these examples, that's the best we can hope for. Right? But there is no serious numerical evidence for this quantity here. It would be much more reasonable to hope that if n is sufficiently great with respect to c, then maybe this is true. Not necessary for this 2c plus 1. OK. Uh, but I think that there is some other expectation, which is less ambitious and which, is, uh, which has very good chances to be true. And uh, <laughs> this is just a particular case. So expectation. Don't work on the Hutchinson conjecture, please. <laughs> so first, make a PhD in some other subject, then you can do whatever you want. But first, get a permanent position to be sure that you won't be kicked out. So the expectation number, I don't know, number three, I think, right? Thank you. Is that the Hartung conjecture holds for fun of right? This is much more reasonable because we know some cases when it is true. Unlike the Hartung conjecture, where <laughs> we don't know any case. People have concentrated especially on the codimension 2 case for the Hartung conjecture, but it's still out of reach. And so many people tried, and some of them rather clever guys, I will quote some of them, and you will see that they are serious people, not like me. Uh, and uh, nothing happened. So um, they, they began to think uh, secretly, secretly, some of our friends, Peskin and Zak, are seeking for a counterexample, secretly. So you see. Instead of trying to prove it, maybe one should look for a counterexample. But I am interested in this very special case in which I believe. OK. Why? So because this is true, so this holds if. So we have two theorems that support this expectation. The first one is codimension 2. This is proved by uh, two Italian mathematician, mathematicians, Ballico and Cantini.
Eduardo Balico and Luca Chianti. So this is a theorem, at least, because I mentioned two. And secondly, it, it, it holds, so two. Only five is, right? Sorry, only five. Yeah, <laughs> Are you kidding? Two. Are you kidding? <laughs> of course, only one, okay. Yeah, Balico and Cantini, beginning of the 80s, Anali di Matematica Pura ed Applicata. I can give you precise uh, references. So. Oh, of course. Yeah. 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 Subcanonical. Right. Subcanonical. Yeah. That's, so that's the point. But uh, the subcanonical means that the uh, canonical bundle is induced, right? Yeah, right, right, right? But the point is that the number <laughs> there has to be negative. Uh, yeah. So it is fun. Yeah, yeah. 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 Sorry? I don't know. Chiantini. Yeah. Chiantini. Well, this is Italian. Chiantini. If you only re look at this, this is a very famous wine. <laughs> Chiantini. Yeah. Yes. And then you put some <laughs> more syllab and you get uh, Chiantini. Okay. And it is also true if x is quadratic. And this was proved by myself and Francesco Russo. Good question. I was preparing to answer it without <laughs> being asked. So uh, you don't need to assume it is funnel. But if you are in this range, it is automatically funnel being quadratic. Actually, so here is some exercise. So maybe uh, quadratic means scheme theoretical and intersection of hyperquadratics. So maybe quadratic, let me write here. So x quadratic means uh, x scheme theoretically defined by equations of degree 2. Okay? And the exercise is as follows. So x quadratic and uh, small co-dimension. then x funnel. Just Sorry? Just smooth. Smooth, smooth. Every, everything smooth. That, that was part of the general assumption. They, they don't use the very small assumption. Sorry? Very small assumption. Small. Yes, 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 yes. Small is enough. So, when it is very small, a fortiori. Okay? No. Okay? So, a priori, it is not funnel, but a posteriori it is. Right? Okay. Uh, so, I will say something about the proof of this result, although it, is, um, it depends on many things. So, I, I'll do some ballet. Hopefully, you will understand something. Uh, but before, uh, let me uh, point out something. This expectation, so maybe a remark here, a remark. The expectation three refers to prime funnels. So to those having cyclic Picard group generated by the hyperplane section. Why? Well, because we are in the Hartson region, it is very, right? It is very, the co-dimension is very small. So this implies A. And this is implied by the Bart Larsen, if you remember, that the Picard group is cyclic. 
generated by the hypertrophy circuit. This was mentioned yesterday. Okay? So that's why. So when I'm talking about this expectation for funnels, actually I'm speaking about point funnels automatically. Because being of very small codimension implies this uh, fact about the Picard group. Okay? So you will see that prime funnels are kind of uh, leitmotif. They will come and come and come over and over again. They are basic blocks of algebraic geometry. And actually, if you heard about the famous Mori theory that produced so many beautiful things, uh, and uh, you know, the guy was awarded the Fields Medal, and then some 10, 15 people took invited addresses in various uh, international congresses. So uh, that's a very popular subject. And uh, somehow one of the important uh, byproducts of Mori theory was classification of funnel varieties by extremal rays and all those things. But for prime funnels, the Picard group is cyclic. So the only possible contraction is to a point. <laughs> so Mori theory uh, is not producing uh, something directly. I mean, contractions are irrelevant here. It's so, And uh, as you know, Mori, together with Mukai, uh, classified completely Fano's refold. But with one exception, prime Fano's. When the, the Picard group is cyclic, and uh, these were worked out First by Fano himself, which kind of explains the terminology, and Iskovsky in some uh, famous papers uh, that were before the appearance of Morris theory. Good. Now, let me show you some. So I promised something about uh, this. It will come. But... Uh, it needs a lot of preparations because uh, the proof is uh, not at all uh, direct. I mean, we have to, to go to see the mountains, then a trip uh, on uh, Jeju Island, and then uh, maybe we will arrive at the proof. So let me give you some, uh, some consequence. Why do I think that this would be uh, an important and uh, Nice result. Just look at some consequences. And this gives me the opportunity to speak about that part that uh, yesterday was uh, omitted because uh, I was preoccupied for the health of uh, people here. They were dying, some of them. So I stopped. And let me complete this. and say something about this point. So now I make a digression on a small degree. So, uh, so let me for the poor students, uh, some more exercise. So uh, assume that x in Pn is non-degenerate. This is essential of degree d. Then prove that the degree is always bigger equal than codimension plus 1. OK? That's Nice. You, you will enjoy the proof. So uh, why am I mentioning this? Simply because then if a variety will be of small degree in whatever sense, it will automatically be of small codimension 2, right? So these are kind of related. OK? Good. Now, my definition of small degree is the following one, and is uh, actually the content of a theorem. I am uh, quite proud of. 
uh, it has a sad story, this theorem. I proved this theorem in 2000. And, so, yes. Oh. And then, uh, and then uh, some uh, bastards acted as referees, uh -huh. <laughs> and they, they rejected the paper. Uh -huh. And I was very angry, and I said, OK, you don't want my paper. And I put it in, uh, and it stayed there for some years. Okay. Then finally, uh, something nice happened, and uh, some editor told me that, uh, but this is a very nice result. And I said, ah, really? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it finally appeared. It appeared actually in a good journal, in uh, Commentari Matematici Helvetici. Uh -huh. Uh, in 2008, so uh, eight years after it was <laughs> published, it was on the archive. So that's people, cool. people interested. So that's why I said, "You don't want it, be blessed," and I put it <laughs> there. So finally, it appeared. But that's not important. Uh, let me explain the the statement and uh, kind of explain why I I think there is uh, of some significance. So assume, so the degree, the usual context, is at most capital N. So you see, small in the sense that it is at most the dimension of the ambient projective space. OK? Then what I proved is that there are two possibilities. Either x is funnel is a prime funnel or I have a complete list which is kind of uh, surprising because you know when you fix the degree and the capital N right you have finiteness of the Hilbert scheme, right? So you have finitely many families, and you are not surprised that you can classify them, right? There are finitely many. But here, nothing is fixed. So be careful. Dimension and codimension are arbitrary. So why the result should be a finite list? <coughs> that not, uh, eh? not to mention that even if it is finite, finding all of them is, a, is, a, is far from being trivial, right? So they are all rational. And now, maybe you know that funnels and rational varieties, and more generally, if you know what this means, rationally connected manifolds are simply connected. So in particular, from my classification, you can deduce that that's why I was looking for some topologist, that these guys are simply connected. Moreover, the result, this, this is best possible because you can construct so there exist elliptic scrolls so elliptic scrolls means scrolls in the sense of the definition I gave yesterday over an elliptic curve so elliptic scrolls or scroll over C elliptic curve of any dimension such that their degree is n plus 1. And of course, this cannot be simply connected because the first uh, Betty number is 2, right? It's the same as the first Betty number of an elliptic curve, so, right? so they, are, they are not simply connected, right? Hey, topologist, where are you? <laughs> I prepared something for you. Okay? 
So uh, this result is kind of at the limit of what you can expect and shows a nice qualitative property of all manifolds of small degrees are simply connected. Okay? And now let us come to first to this expectation and then to the topological problem I, I sought to, to give you. Now, what's missing? Two things are missing, in my opinion, just to finish with this subject. So first, what about the first case? And here is the moreover. If the expectation holds, so if, let us call the expectation, let us give him a name, give it a name, action conjecture for fungus, so HCF, okay? So, if HCF holds, I have a complete classification in case one, two. Meaning that I can tell you, and this completely explains all the mysteries, I can tell you exactly which prime funnels satisfying this co condition are not complete intersections. Because there, of course, you have some complete intersections. And actually, this explains everything, because kind of the infinite part of the story, where you, you have many things, only consists of complete intersections, and the rest are the exceptional varieties that I managed to catch, to find out and to list, okay? So this is a typical problem in which you want to see all cases but for complete intersections, right? Even complete intersections, there are not so many because in principle, what, what, what's happening? So the degree has to be small with respect to n. So if you fix n, right, you have that the sum or product of the degrees, right, because you have by bezu the degree if for a complete intersection, by bezu the degree of the variety is a product of the degrees of the equation. So this product should be bounded by n. So for fixed n, you have few cases. But if you don't fix n, of course, you have... So this is, let's say, the, general, the generic case, which is kind of trivial, complete intersections, and then you have the exceptions. The list is quite long, so if someone wants to see it, uh, I can give you the paper or the reference. It's, uh, it's available. Okay? So, I am interested in particular to see a definitive form of this theorem, and this depends on the expectation. Okay? This is the first point. Secondly, what I don't like in this theorem is the fact that this qualitative result comes out only a posteriori. So you classify them, you look at the list, and you say, ah, all are rational. So in particular, simply connected. Understand? It would be very nice to give a conceptual proof of this. Moreover, Zach, I, he, he liked this result, which is rare. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, and he uh, suspects that maybe simple connectivity holds even if the variety is not supposed to be smooth, so always. Of course, it would be very nice to be so, but in the non-smooth case, classification is absolutely hopeless. I mean, it's a mess. You cannot dream to classify uh, the general case, but it would be nice if... Uh, so. How to, what would a possible attack on this problem be? I mean, a conceptual proof 
of, of, uh, of uh, the simple connectedness. And I propose the following. So, uh, so idea of proving uh, directly the simple connectedness. So uh, this has some connections with singularity theory and local algebra. So maybe you are uh, interested in. So the idea is very simple and it's uh, quite typical. So here you have the projective space. And you look at the projecting cone of your variety. Uh, it has, of course, a singularity in its vertex. Right? And one of the big principles that connect, here I will be very pedagogical to satisfy my, my friend who invited me here. So one of the basic principles in connecting local and global things is the following. So here you look globally. And you know that algebraically, this means graded ring theory, right? And then taking the Proish and blah, blah, and blah, blah. On the other uh, part of the dictionary, you have local algebra, which is more general than the global things. How do you pass from one to the other? One way, you take the projecting cone and you localize in the vertex. Intuitively, you look at the germ of this singularity. The germ of this singularity remembers the projective variety. Because if you throw out the vertex, the singular point, this guy, being a cone, uh, the pointed cone, contracts to the base. Right? So let's say the cone without the vertex has the same homotopy type as the variety. So if you want to speak about uh, topological properties, that's OK, right? So what do you do? You have a graded ring. You take the irrelevant ideal, and you localize. So that's one way. Vice versa. You have a local ring, or a, singular, a germ of singularities, right? There is a famous construction called uh, associated graded ring, which is a graded ring. And its push is nothing but the tangent cone at the singularity. And the uh, linear envelope is the Zariski tangent space. The first part, m over m square, right? And then you have the other terms. OK. Obviously. One is more general than the other because singularities that appear from projective geometry are conical in the sense that <laughs> if you take the, uh, ho the homogeneous coordinate ring, you localize, and then you take the tangent cone, then you get the same thing at the level of the approach, right? While in general, a singularity needs not be conical, right? OK. Now, let's go back to our problem. So how to interpret the con <laughs> essential condition I have here in topological or local algebra terms? Let's see. First, the easy part. What is n? So n was the dimension of the ambient projective space. OK? The variety was non-degenerate. Don't eat drops while I'm talking. <laughs> I'm joking. You can take pills if you feel bad. <laughs> but I'm not supposed to eat drops. So, so I'm, 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 I'm giving you bitter moments, so you feel the need to sweeten them with something. I can understand. So I repeat. What is the uh, capital N? So is the space 
linearly generated by the variety. So this tells you that the tangent space here at the vertex is the whole affine space. Okay? So if I consider x to be the vertex of a fine projective cone over x, and I take OXX to be the local ring, which you can imagine or respectively if you take uh, uh, maybe not x uh, let us call this uh, x tilde because it's a cone right so this is a germ of say isolated singularity isolated means that x is loose right if x is loose then the vertex is the only singularity so it's an isolated singularity so here you can speak in terms of local algebra here you can speak in terms of singularity theory it depends on your preference so then what is capital n plus one capital n plus one is a dimension of the affine ambient space and this is what is called the embedding dimension of the local ring that is to say the dimension of m over m square okay so this is i don't know how you embedding dimension of uh, or x tilde x, right? The embedded dimension, right? The, the okay, a dimension of the tangent space. So this is clear. Now, what is the degree? So uh, the degree, uh, the degree, it's a nice exercise for beginners. Uh, translates here is nothing but the multiplicity of the local ring. So you see, global invariant of projective variety, most important invariant, maybe uh, corresponds to most important invariant of the of the local ring, namely its multiplicity. So degree of x is nothing but the multiplicity of uh, OXX, OX to the x. Okay. Now, what is my condition? So. Uh, maybe I should uh, erase something, but uh, not too not too much. Well, well I erase this because I. So condition translates into. So assume this is a germ of isolated singularity. Uh, and assume that the uh, multiplicity of uh, the singularity of the local ring is smaller equals than then embedding dimension minus one, right? Because it was n the embedded dimension minus one, and of uh, in particular dimension of uh, x is at least two, right? Because uh, you started with something non-trivial here, dimension at least one, so the cone is of dimension at least. Uh, so this, maybe this, implies that the local fundamental group is trivial. Local fundamental group, let me recall you, is a fundamental group of the space that is obtained by removing the point. Okay, so you have the germ, and you remove the point, and you hope to prove that uh, it is simply connected. And by what I told previously, this would imply the simple connectedness of this, because you, you understand, yeah? The, I removed the point, so this retracts on this, so it's, it's, uh, this would be a topological way of proving uh, a qualitative result, namely that. And this, I think, is quite interesting. I mean, I haven't seen references in the le literature to, to such points. So uh, if you have local rings where the multiplicity is small with respect to the embedded uh, dimension, 
then something, uh, something sexy happens in the style that uh, maybe the local fundamental group is trivial or something. This, uh, for, for people working in singularities, I, I'm not an expert, huh? should, be, should be meaningful. Okay? So, so yeah. Uh, he expects that uh, that isolated singularity would not be essential. <laughs> yeah. yeah, meaning that X is maybe not. Case. Yes, okay. yes, yes. Singular case means you you forget about about this part of the hypothesis. Exactly, exactly. Okay. So hopefully this you. I don't know. I think it's uh, it's meaningful. And moreover, so maybe. Assume singularity to be uh, homogeneous or conical because it's the vertex of the cone, right? So you have a some cis direction. Algebraically, uh, this is the following. So <laughs> you take a local ring, right? And you take the uh, associated graded ring, right? And you localize the associated graded ring in the irrelevant ideal. In general, you get something different from the original local ring. Right? If they are equal, you can say the singularity is a cone type because, right? Yeah? Yeah? So it's, it coincides with its tangent cone, if you want which is clearly the case exactly when x is a cone. <laughs> so in geometrical terms, this is. So this is, uh, so, uh, so I don't know if this holds in general, because I'm interested in this very particular case when the singularity is, uh, is conical, is, comes with some system. OK? OK? So this was, uh, this was, um, Part that I uh, wanted to uh, this is uh, let's say related to small degrees, but there is some other uh, expectation here that I very much believe to be true and which also would be in my opinion a very nice result. Let me can I you right? It's okay? Yeah, well, if you have questions, I'm... Okay, so uh, forget about the theorem. I have uh, some other expectation that is... Uh, embedded, embedded dimension is a dimension of the tangent space. So uh, you have a local ring A, comma, M. M is the unique maximal ideal. Mm. It's a dimension of M over M square. Yeah. Uh, 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 where does it come? This is the first obstruction to embed it in something smooth. It has to be of at least this dimension, otherwise you cannot, because the tangent space will embed. That's, uh, this explains the terminology, of course. OK? Now, here comes the conjecture. And uh, here I am uh, I'm, uh, proud that uh, uh, I think that uh, my name uh, comes uh, near some famous name. I like to amuse myself with such comments that will remain for the posterity, or posteriority, I don't know. Uh, so uh, don't put this on the internet, <laughs> otherwise I <laughs> comment. <laughs> I'll send all the, all the Yakuza bosses to kill you. Okay, so uh, uh, this is the expectation, and I will explain it, number four, and I think that uh, the first name is Bart, and I put mine too, and this is really very, very sexy. So, as usual, degree, assume it now it is very small, namely dimension minus 1. So previously it was capital N. 
So you, you can add the co-dimension which can be arbitrarily large. Then x is a complete intersection. Now I I wait five seconds to see if there are reactions. Beep. No reaction. Unless there is a counterexample. <laughs> Unless, but it is only one. X is a Grassmannian of lines in P4, Plucker embedded in P9. So my notation for the Grassmannians are um, projective notation. So G14 means lines in P4, or planes in P5, or in, uh, in A5. Right? In the affine space. So why is this interesting? So first of all, it's the best possible result. Right? Secondly, it's a linear bound. And uh, what is known? There is something important known. So known, and this is due to Bart and Van der Ven, and it is the content of the invited lecture at the International Congress in Vancouver in uh, '74 of Bart. Yeah, Vancouver. ICM invited talk by Bart. It's a pity because this makes the result very hardly accessible. If you don't have the proceedings volume of the Vancouver Congress, <laughs> you won't find it. And it's a pity. And let me explain why this is, uh, is uh, important and uh, quite sexy. So what they proved is that if the degree is smaller or equal than some function of n, which actually they show to be quadratic, I, I don't guarantee that this is correct, but if my memories are intact, uh, yeah. You have to be careful about the memory because women say that the memory is the second thing that left you. Mm. So, uh, uh, don't show this to undergraduates. Uh, so, this is an ugly bound. And it is, uh, you see, it says nothing. But it is extremely important to have some bound, be it horrible as it could, right? Now, what about my bound? This is optimal. So, this is optimal. Best possible bound. Any comment? Because, take P1 times P n minus 1, segregate. Well, where it should, uh, you have to compute 2 times n minus 1, if I'm not wrong. Uh, no, I'm wrong. 2, 2, uh, yes, it's, it's okay. This guy has degree n. And is not a complete intersection, of course, if n is at least 3. So, end of story. My bound is optimal. Because these exist for any n, right? 
Understand? So I was looking for the best bound such that if the degree is more or equal than that guy, it is a complete intersection. And I claim this is the best possible. Well, it has one exception, but it is only one, right? And this is because already if the degree equals n, you have infinitely many, uh, right? So now two things. First, why is this important? Well, that this bound is beautiful and this one is ugly, I think it's obvious for everybody. This is uh, linear, that is uh, quadratic, this is optimal, that is not, and so on and so forth. That's not the point. Why is it important to have any bound to begin with? Because of the following extremely interesting uh, phenomenon that was discovered by Hartshorn and independently by Bart and Van de Ven. And Hartshorn talked for the first time about it. In 74, when the Congress took place, in the same paper when he proposed the conjecture. And the reason is the following. Look here. It is called uh, Babylonian Tower Type Theorems and is one of the main themes of research for people doing uh, vector bundles and things like this. And it started from this problem, which is extremely natural. So, take a complete intersection, any complete intersection, okay? Then, obviously, by keeping the same degrees, you can lift it, so to say, prolong, can you say prolong? Mm. Extend. You can extend it. So, your given complete intersection is a hyperplane section of the next one, which in its turn is a hyperplane section of the next one. And there is no limit. You simply keep the same degrees, but you increase the dimension. You understand? So, it goes to infinity. Question. Are there any other varieties but for the complete intersections having this property, that is to say, infinitely extendable? So, you fix, when you extend, the degree is fixed, right? Because when you take a hyperplane section, you don't modify the degree. So, question, if you fix the degree and let the dimension be arbitrarily huge, large, does it follow that the variety is necessarily a complete intersection? Yes. Any bound would be good, right? So I fixed the degree, right? If the dimension is huge enough to satisfy this, which eventually happens <laughs> sometimes, then uh, uh, it's a complete intersection. That's what they proved. Okay? So this, this is indeed, and that's not a stupidity, that, that's a fundamental question. So can you extend a variety like this infinitely? Yes, you can, only if it is, if and only if it is a complete intersection. So from this point of view, which was the point of view and the interest of Barth uh, and Van de Ven on one hand and Hartson on the other, Hartson gave up because his proof uh, didn't work. So uh, he had the idea, but the proof, uh, uh, but Barth and Van de Ven succeeded and you find the proof in that, uh, in that uh, uh, talk by, by Barth at the ICM. So, Okay, I convinced you that this is, uh, this is interesting, okay? Now the next point, what is the link with the expectation? The link is, so, observation or proposition, a expectation for follows from expectation three. that is Hartshorn conjecture for Fanos. So, if the Hartshorn conjecture for Fanos would be true, 
then this nice bound would be true. Okay? I'd like to prove this if you follow. Interested? Proposition. Yes, this is a proposition. Yeah. A proposition by Paltin. So you should denote it by P. By Paltin? By, no, by Paltin. <laughs> Not Paltin. <laughs> Paltin is uh, after. <laughs> Paltin will be on the blackboard, but yeah, you have to I wait a bit. Yes, uh, he. Uh, Faltings has the best result about the Hartshorn conjecture in general. Yes, and I will speak about it, but. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for the compliment. I, I'm honored. I'm deeply honored. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a good relation with him. Yeah. We played chess together. He was in Romania. You know that he. Because you asked. The first place mm -hmm. where his proof of the Mordell conjecture <laughs> uh -huh. was presented outside Germany oh. was in Bucharest. Oh, really? Yes, in uh, 83 at our algebraic geometry conference. Mm -hmm. And that was our first meeting. And then we have met several times in various places. Mm -hmm. But he was at least two times in Romania. Mm -hmm. The first time when he explained this, there were no free places in the, the biggest amphitheater <laughs> the University of Bucharest. I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah. OK. So let me explain why, why this is so. So you see, even for Thanos, uh, the Hartshorn conjecture would have very nice conjectures, uh, very nice consequences. I will, I will uh, give you some other examples. In, uh, but this is uh, one particularly nice application. Okay, so this is optimal, and this follows from the Hartshorn conjecture for final. So I think. Uh, okay, so I gave uh, people what uh, belongs to them, and now I would uh, like to. Do you show the proof of this one? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> the proof of proposition. It is, in, uh, it is not explicit, but it is implicit in my paper in uh, Commentary Mathematici Helvetici that I mentioned. So it is, uh, it is there. But implicit, not explicit. So better, better, to, better to, to give an argument. It's a small computation, but I prefer to. OK, so uh, let us assume d more or equal n minus 1, right? Remember by the exercise, d is always at least co-dimension plus 1, right? So from here, you get that uh, n is at least c plus 2. So by Bart Larsen, the Picard group is cyclic generated by the hyperplane section. So we know that. OK? OK? Next, I claim x is funnel. So prime funnel. Why? There is a nice argument that belongs to Bart himself. So. I project uh, birationally uh, x birationally and generically x to a hypersurface. When you project generically, the degree is preserved. But to acquire singularities and blah, blah, and blah, blah. So you get that x will be birational to some hypersurface y in p and plus 1, right? Of the same degree. Because a projection is generic, right? If you project once more, you get a finite covering of of course, right? So you 
you stop at the, uh, not at the last step. At the OK. But now, you have this condition that this degree is smaller than n minus 1, right? So there is a line passing through the general point of y. For, for hypersurfaces is, of, of small degree, it is easy to see that they are covered by lines. So, so uh, y is covered by lines. So this implies that x is also. All right? Because you take a line, you are at the general point, right? And th th at the general point, this is a, an isomorphism. And you, the line then uh, transfers from y to, to x, and the degree is kept, to, it remains a line. And then, if the, the exercise for the students, exercise, so x, so pick, pick, cyclic and covered by lines in the sense that there is a line through the general point, then final. This is easy. The idea is that uh, what, what do you want? You want that the canonical is not positive, right? Because the anti-canonical is positive, right? And this comes from the fact that, so I give a hint, so show 